Central New York's Hidden History is sponsored by Metro Mattress, Burn Dairy and Deli, and Kinney Drugs. The only thing we done wrong was stay in the wilderness too long. Keep your hand on the plow, hold on. The only thing we done right was the day we began to fight. Keep your hand on the plow, hold on. <laughs> The fight for civil rights can be lonely, dangerous, and sometimes even deadly. I'm Jennifer Sanders, and for this edition of Hidden History, we go all the way back to the 1940s. That's when blacks and whites were fighting side by side for justice. This is a story of CORE, the Congress of Racial Equality. Our own objectives are clear, smashing the militarism imposed by warlords upon their enslaved people. The year was 1942. America was at war. We are fighting as our fathers have fought to uphold the doctrine that all men are equal. Black soldiers and white soldiers fighting for the same cause, but still separated by racism. Segregation and Jim Crow laws made equality impossible on U.S. soil. Groups like the NAACP and the Urban League were soldiers here at home, fighting for civil rights. In 1942, another group joined that fight. They were called CORE, the Congress of Racial Equality. Their mission was nonviolent interracial activism, with blacks and whites fighting side by side for justice. They were created as a pacifist, nonviolent group, working to improve race relations and indiscriminatory practices. They sought to desegregate travel through the journey of reconciliation what's become known as one of the first freedom rides. And from there, CORE begins really um, implementing the nonviolent tactics, particularly of sit-ins. So they organized really the first national sit-in in 1947. And that tactic uh, then gets picked up um, by groups you know, across the country and CORE sort of proliferates. Much of that proliferation happened in the 60s, using stand-ins, picket lines, and voter registration drives, all to combat segregation in housing, education, and employment. Most notable were those freedom rides. Reverend Leroy Glenn Wright became a freedom rider while attending Fisk University, his activism stemming from brutal treatment that he endured in the South. So we had stand-ins, we got arrested for the sit-ins and stand-ins, we had hot water poured on us, nightstick, hit with nightsticks and all that. Before his freedom ride to Jackson, Mississippi, he caught word that fellow friends and freedom riders had been attacked in Alabama. And they escorted us from Montgomery to Jackson, Mississippi. We were arrested for going in the white waiting room, which was against the law in, in Mississippi. The charge, breach of peace. At the same time as that turmoil in the South, organizers were pulling together a chapter of CORE right here in Syracuse. Their leader was organic chemistry professor at Syracuse University, Dr. George Wiley. First they said people couldn't sing, and now they say they can't even stand on the sidewalk where they're going to be arrested. I mean, they keep changing, keep changing. The what about uh, Wilbur Mills? Have you seen Congressman Mills yet? What are you going to do if he Well, he's been you? unwilling. Well, we're waiting here to see him. He was a chemist, so he had that analytical mind. Uh, he could see how we could participate and demonstrate uh, so that we were all safe. He was very serious about 
helping to make changes for African Americans in this community. Liz Page joined CORE in her freshman year in 1961. Why did I do it? I guess because I wanted opportunities for other folks who didn't have them. So did Dale and Ann Tusing, who started meeting at Grace Episcopal Church. A bomb scare came to the church because of our meeting there. And Reverend Welsh was very much in favor of what we were doing, but his congregation was, you know, they were scared. Reverend Emory Proctor of People's AME Zion Church immediately welcomed the group to his church on Fayette Street. Inez Hurd also hosted meetings in her home at Pioneer Homes, fast becoming the front line of the fight. And they used to call her Mrs. Core. She was a fierce woman to deal with. I would come downstairs, there'd be adults in the living room, people I did not know. They would be singing. Uh, certain fight songs, I would call them fight songs, not knowing they were really protest songs. You know, we shall overcome, that, I was sort yeah. of the, the anthem of the Yeah, and the only movement. thing that we done wrong, staying in the wilderness too long. The only thing that we done right was the day we began to fight. Keep your hand on the while, hold on. on. holding on to what they saw as right at any cost. The fight now against substandard housing, job discrimination, and de facto segregation in Syracuse was intensified. Dr. Martin Luther King, JR. Thank you, Mr. Randolph. I would simply like to say that I think this has been one of the great days of America. And I think this march will go down as one of the greatest, if not the greatest, uh, demonstrations for freedom and human dignity ever held in the United States. The year was 1963, and CORE, the Congress of Racial Equality, co-sponsored the March on Washington. I have a dream today. A century after emancipation, more than 200,000 people standing in solidarity in front of the Lincoln Memorial advocating for Dr. King's dream. Several CORE members from Syracuse were there. As a young person, and I mean really young person, it was just sort of, it's seen a lot of movement and that understanding, per se, not until, the, I guess, the March on Washington, but in the clarity, because first of all, my mother went and I saw her on TV, believe it or not. That was amazing. Dale Tusing joined CORE after attending the March on Washington. He could see just how important and difficult the fight would be. And then a couple of weeks later, I got a call. He said, we have been protesting against the demolition of housing. By the way, none of none of the CORE's activities were in the news. It was they were boycotted by the news media, the TV and the, the news the newspapers. Urban renewal and the construction of Interstate 81 taking center stage in CORE's fight for justice. What was known as the 15th War a tight-knit African-American neighborhood just east and south of downtown Syracuse, completely decimated, all to pave the way for the interstate, upstate medical university, and other businesses in that area. Hundreds of black families were forced out of their homes. They're just encroaching upon the whole area of the 15th Ward. They moved out everybody out of that area. You know, I remember when Upstate Medical Center was built from the ground up. 350 homes gone. That's not even getting to the trees and, and other things that were just wiped out completely. You know, that was a big fight for quite a while. You know, did they think about the community? Did they think about us at all in, in, in the process? Of course they didn't. Poor leaders decided they had to take drastic measures to stop urban renewal. 
Members would go to demolition sites and go beyond picketing. They would climb on cranes, lay in front of bulldozers, sit in the cabs of trucks, bringing some of that demolition work to a halt. Oh, I think they saw we were radicals. Um, and uh, everything is fine, so I don't know why you're out there in the street. Everything was not fine. I felt a real sense of oneness with the other people who, mm -hmm. who were involved. At the same time, I was always just a little bit scared. It was always a little bit frightening because what was happening? People, people were about to be taken off to jail. <laughs> Del Tusing is one of them. He's on the front page of this Post Standard article. He was arrested along with nearly a hundred others, including Syracuse University faculty. But despite the protests, the demolition continued. Families were forced to use small vouchers to find another place to live. That's when CORE realized it had another big fight on its hands. Redlining, substandard housing, and unfair rental practices towards blacks. We had experiments where a white couple would go and, you know, to, to a place that had been advertised for, set, for rent and they would be, uh, you know, they would have a certain price given for the rent and then a black couple would go. The black person would go out housing uh, for rent or even for sale. Uh, that person would go out, they'd be denied. Uh, well, we can't show it to you. According to a 1963 statement from the State Commission on Human Rights, 41% of all housing complaints filed in upstate New York in 1962 came from Syracuse. So CORE presented proposals they believe were the first steps on the road to social justice for the entire community. Project 101, the document that CORE puts together in the summer of 1964, is really an incredible um, document and compendium of data and solutions and uh, policy proposals to really help what they said, you know, desegregate Syracuse. It starts out by saying, for Negroes in Syracuse, a limited choice of housing allows unscrupulous slumlords to charge exorbitant rents for decrepit, rat-infested tenements. Segregated neighborhoods lead to segregated schools, destruction of motivation and educational, economic and social deprivation. The mayor's office established a commission on human rights, which they claim was the best approach to combat discrimination. But when asked to review housing complaints, the commission ruled it had no power to act on housing cases. Housing segregation led to education, to dis uh, disparities, and that was part of the pattern uh, uh, of uh, employment uh, mm -hmm. disparities. And, and so, and so, so, yeah. There, it's all the, a piece, all of a piece. Those disparities would lead to a different struggle, one that would gain national attention. In the 1960s, stores lined the streets of a bustling downtown Syracuse. Business was good, but diversity among employees was not. So beginning in 1963, there's a, there's a real push to boycott um, and picket. Uh, it begins at the Hotel Syracuse um, that year, basically calling for the hotel to hire African American workers to be bellmen, um, to, you know, to have better jobs that have access to tips. Right, and that was something that they were um, very explicit about because, again, tips are where you can make some, some serious money. Um, those bo and that actually worked, so the hotel actually started hiring African-American bellmen as a result of that. Core was hoping to get a similar response from other downtown businesses. So we, we tried to meet with them and a a ask, you know, that they would change the policies. And eventually we wound up with a... Uh, Christmas boycott. In the 
Christmas season of 63, they boycotted and picketed the department stores that lined Salina Street. So Day Brothers, Witherills, um, Edwards, right? Uh, again, protesting hiring practices, the fact that there weren't very many African Americans working, if at all, and maybe if they were working, they were working as a custodian or some sort of low-level job. Del Tusing was the chair of that Christmas boycott. Every day, they marched back and forth down South Salina Street, picketing businesses and demanding change. But they didn't feel like their voices were being heard. They didn't seem to feel they had to do, to do anything in response to us. So they just kind of ignored it. When they, 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 they remember them saying to, to me, how long have you lived here? You, you're not from here, are you? And things like that. So, so we, we had the, what we call sit-in, uh, uh, and they, they would arrest us, and put us in jail, charge us. Sometimes they would dismiss it depending on what the circumstances are. You read the press coverage of these um, protests, and they're not very flattering to the protesters, right? Um, if they were covered at all, they were generally covered in a way that sort of uh, depicted them as troublemakers or rabble rousers and that sort of thing. Despite the media coverage and little to no responses from the businesses, Core would continue their fight, this time. They took it to the biggest utility company in the state. They wanted Niagara Mohawk to end discriminatory practices and hire minorities. When we demonstrated Niagara Mohawk, uh, folks would give us their bills to pay in pennies. Uh, and we did that for three years, rain, sleet, and snow. And we would go into the office on, uh, off of uh, Erie Boulevard West and pay the bills at lunch hour, and that tied up the line and then they finally began to hear us. They were even joined by protesters from the Selma March, bringing national headlines. If you hold some people's feet to the fire, you can actually get some things done. So the protests in Niagara Mohawk uh, go on for a, a couple days. Um, and in the end, obviously Niagara Mohawk uh, capitulates and starts to hire African Americans in a frequency that had been completely um, unseen up to that point, um, which is sort of, if you think about it, implicit recognition uh, on the part of Niagara Mohawk that they had in fact not been hiring uh, folks that they should. Their calls for diversity reverberated through the city. Change was finally on the horizon. My fellow citizens, we have come now to a time of testing. We must not fail. This Civil Rights Act is a challenge to all of us to eliminate the last vestiges of injustice in our beloved country. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you. The Civil Rights Act, the Voting Rights Act, desegregation on public transportation. With each protest, the Congress of Racial Equality and other civil rights groups were slowly seeing change, all signs that their fight was not in vain. But it's those unsung people who were my parents' generation who really were the shoulders we stood on, both in terms of politics, education, um, employment, housing, and just trying to help us stay alive. Like Inez Heard. She was a facilitator, but also she was, uh, you know, a strong activist. She um, many a time, you know, threatened to go to jail and, th and so forth. And she'd be the first one out to protest anything. After years of advocacy, CORE began to dissolve. But for many, there was still a lot of work to do. I'm just passionate about, uh, uh, you, know, you know, equal rights for people and, and respect due for not just black people, but for anybody who, is, who has been hindered in some form or fashion. I 
think that's probably, I, I feel that's our main contribution was being part of the great awakening that took place in those days in the civil rights era. Yeah, it was a very important part of our life, but, and I, I just regret that there hasn't been more progress and, you know, there's still work to be done. Although the Congress of Racial Equality no longer exists in central New York today, segregation and racism still do. CORE's mission, though, to work side by side and fight the injustices in our community together, regardless of race, can still serve as a lesson to us all today. I'm Jennifer Sanders. Thank you so much for joining me for this edition of Hidden History. Central New York's Hidden History is sponsored by Metro Mattress, Burn Dairy and Deli, and Kinney Drugs.